of the Mughal Garden. Uh, and we have with us today uh, Bishwadeep Moitra, who is the editor of this book and is an independent graphic designer, photographer and writer-editor, uh, perhaps best known for designing magazine covers as well as illustrated books. Uh, we have Bridget Singh. Uh, she first came to Sangonair Jaipur's hand block printing center from France as a student of miniatures more than three decades ago. Uh, today, her exquisite work is a form of reenacted design history, yielding a truly Indian aesthetic, fully formed and yet open to influences. Uh, they'll be in conversation with B.N. Goswami, uh, a leading Indian art historian and an Namaskar. emeritus professor of art Welcome history at Punjab University. Festival 2018. His work has significantly influenced thinking on Indian painting, and he's the author of more than 25 books and the recipient of many honours. Um, I'll now invite Bipin Shah uh, of Mappin, the largest publisher of illustrated books on Indian art and culture, to introduce the print dress of the Mughal Garden. Thank you. Welcome to this much-awaited uh, publishing of Bridget Singh's work over the years. Uh, welcome to Dr. Goswami, Bridget, Vishwadeep. Uh, in the world of publicity and selfies, Bridget has remained a recluse over the years. I don't know how many of you have actually seen on stage uh, to launch her own works. Uh, and we are delighted that we had an opportunity to uh, you know, work on her book. Uh, she has been known amongst the textile connoisseurs and the designers around the world for her work, but she has remained uh, sort of behind the screen. As a publisher of illustrated books on art and culture over the years, we had approached uh, Bridget Singh about 15, 20 years back uh, with trepidation that we are going to be able to convince her to do some work for us. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work. And thanks to Nicolas Idier of the French Book Office and uh, Bishwadeep Maitra, who made this happen uh, recently. Uh, we, are doing, we have done something special on this book, which is Introduction of Augmented Reality, uh, which with the help of Anand Shah from Ignite Solutions, uh, which he will demonstrate these towards the end of this session. Welcome. Thank you. Vishwadeep. Dear friends, the ball rolled and dropped in a slot. The path that led to the making of this book had that natural randomness. How else do I explain my interest in block printing? My habitat was the newsroom, brutal, intrusive, judging. No posts roses, no tulip provincials grew on my terra firma. Meeting Bridget happened by natural law of progression. My beautiful and talented wife, Iris, had lived and worked with Bridget when she arrived in India from France, grieving herself over like a daughter to a local maternal guardian spirit in a foreign land. I had heard about Bridget from a colleague, the fashion correspondent of Outlook magazine, who spoke of her as a reclusive diva. The only other piece of information she could offer was from the rumor mill, which went something like this. Bridget had once shut the door on the American ambassador's wife for turning up in her atelier without a prior appointment. I made sure Iris informed Bridget well in advance before we went to see her in her Haveli in Amber for the first time together. Bridget rarely gave an interview. Her work was even rarer a sight in India. Bridget fakes and copies, however, sold merrily, from Tony shops to street side vendors. Only a few close friends could buy her block printed textiles. Commonly, one wondered what exactly this French lady was cooking up in her atelier in Amer that would attract the most renowned decorators from the world. For the elite in India, Bridget is a known name. Her printed fabrics are objects of desire, a pride of possession if one was lucky. Yet, the artist herself is little known. 
she chose to stay away from the city lights in her own world of drawing and printing. It was due to Iris, who made so many beautiful trips to Amir possible for me to enjoy Bridget's hospitality, that there was even a context to which I could hit upon the idea of making a book on this design maestra whose artistry, devotion, and energy had left me spellbound. Little did I realize then what a formidable task I had set for myself. My experience in block printed fabric till then was from, a, from the upholstery material I had brought as a matter of course. Early on in the project, I realized that a craft history of block printing is so deep that I could not possibly learn enough by reading a few reference books on the subject. Jasleen Dhamija lent her ever-loving hand to draw up a list of possible authors who could explain to the readers about the place block printing has in our shared history. Photographing Bridget's enormous collection was a daunting task. I contacted Prabhudo Dasgupta, who was a great admirer of Bridget's work, but the cruel hand of fate took the gracious Prabhudda away from us before he could start my project. I turned to my other friend, Dayanita Singh, who said she would be happy to photograph for the book. But then she asked me, why don't you shoot yourself? It was too good a gauntlet to let go a begging. Bridget's meticulous catalog of her work, into which I dived headlong, were like a bottomless archive. How to condense all of what the printers had done over three decades into one book? What does one leave out? From which layer should I start? Which layer shall I treat as the top one? To fall back on what I am best at, visual storytelling, was the logical beginning. For a start, I designed a grid for the book that would set the pace of the narration. Bridget's Rajasthani style Haveli, constructed around a medieval ruin, which now serves as a Shivala, a black hooded king cobra, cobra is a regular visitor here before the Lord, was a setting la parfait for photographing her beautifully printed textiles. What followed were many trips on long weekends from Delhi on the treacherous National Highway 8 over the next four years, enjoying and discovering every bit I encountered. Once I would park my car inside the iron gates of the Haveli, the world would change for me till I exited. As the clock strikes nine every morning, a stream of women and men from villages near and afar enter the Haveli, which houses the printing workshop, tailoring unit, atelier, studio, kitchen and flower gardens, cow and goat sheds, the carpentry workshop, a swimming pool, and Bridget and her daughter Leela's dwelling unit. Nobody who enters the premises is ever idle. You speak only when you are spoken to. Bridget may be there or not, but the rhythm to which the printer's block rise and fall keeps to the score sheet laid down by the conductor herself. The devotion with which Ramadin collects bandar ki roti, seeds of the chilbil tree, used as a substitute for pine wood seeds, how Dharman, the Rajasthani French fusion cook from Garhwal, gives those seeds over to the pesto sauce he will prepare, how Savita's deft fingers so through the fine muslins all day long without a hint of monotony. All of these 60 pe odd people here have imbibed into their own cells some parts of Bridget Singh, an idea of what it is like to do things perfectly. Bilkis disapproves of the knot I have tied to hold the chick I am about to photograph. Mame Sahab gathers the rope like this, she demonstrates, and you make one knot here. She's right. The aesthetic effect of Bilkis's intervention is evident from the photograph I just shot. It's 1 p.m., lunch break. Women and men sprawl out on the lush grass or under the shady neem and amla trees within the Haveli. The sound of tick and thud will turn into a low hum and buzz for this hour. Tongues wag between gossips on the tailor's daughter's elopement and the chili pickle Jamna has got, with equal relish. A short tea interval before the day, a well-orchestrated bustle has come to a close at 5 p.m. The calming silence befalls the Haveli as the sun goes down behind the walls of the distant Amir fort. 
tomorrow will be another day. Thank you. Now, may I request Brigitte and, Prof. Gos and Professor Goswami to launch the book by unveiling this large cardboard book. We have a real copy too. Please. We'll take a few seconds to remove the display. And uh, may I request for the next program a conversation between Professor Goswami and Brigit Singh? But I'll speak when I've spoken too, right? <laughs> you can speak whenever. I have a, dra a dragon reputation. <laughs> taking just a minute to present the real copy to the print press. And Professor Goswam. Now that I have the permission to speak, <laughs> uh, let me say a couple of things, Bridget. <clears throat> I have some reservation about launching of books, and I'll tell you a little story. Please do. Many years ago, I was in Ahmedabad, and an architect, German architect by the name of Popo, a book was pre presented to him by his students or whatever. And everyone sort of stood with this book like this and so on. And the great architect B.V. Doshi was there. So he did this and B.V. Doshi was short of time and he left. And Popo came on the stage and said, this is not much of a launch. And then he had a little piece of wood to which four strings were attached. He put the book on that and asked these four students of his, now pull. The book went up into the air and said, that's a launch. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is too heavy for that. <laughs> yes. Anyway, <clears throat> my ignorance of textiles is of serious proportions. I love textiles. I know very little about them. And I'm in company which is a bit awe-inspiring. But a couple of things, Bridget. I'm always intrigued by how the first flush of thought comes to the mind of a creator like you. First flush of thought. You know, thoughts can come from all directions and so on and so forth, from seeing, from hearing, from observing, from having done things similar to that and so on. The reason why I ask is this. Uh, or maybe you should answer that first, and then I'll, I'll come to the reason why I asked you this. The first, I think the first thought often comes, the first, the first thought of a print or of a design to become a print usually comes from my, my way of looking at everything with you know, wandering eyes, and, and anything can capture my eye. I think I do live a lot by what I see and by what I look at. 
And I think that's why I loved looking at paintings and I was extremely privileged to have in my hands many treasures when I came to India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the first big um, event that happened to me uh, as a youth before I came to India, mm -hmm. and I think there is a session between you know, about Rembrandt and, uh, and the Mughals was about traveling to Holland and going to a museum. And unlike in France, museums in Holland are open to everybody. And uh, I went to the reception and asked if I could look at drawings from Rembrandt. And I said, yes, of course. And uh, they set me at a table and I watched these drawings, not believing that I could actually do it. And, and, and so the same thing happened to me when I came to India. I had, it was a feast all the time. It was a feast for my, for my soul through my eyes and my way of looking at things. And so it was naturally textiles because it's a, a crazy world for textiles and, and but paintings and, uh, and uh, stories within stories. No, um, I had the privilege of looking at this book um, two nights ago. It's a fantastically produced book. Not only do we see great things, but we hear great thoughts, which come from Bridget's own mind. And some of the quotes in this, some of the statements she makes, are quite extraordinary. The subtlety, the refinement of workmanship, and the refinement of thought which goes with it. You know, it reminds me of a, of a Urdu word, a Persian word called chatak. I'm sure many of you know the word, but chatak is not only the brightness of colors and so on, that's one of the meanings of that. Chatak is a poetic conceit. This is a sound which a bud makes when it opens. A sound you and I cannot hear at all. It's a notional sound. But it's a question of refinement, question of sensibility. You know, the, the great poet Josh Malahi Wadi said once, Itna manus hum fitrat se kali jab chatki, jhuk ke maine je kaha mujh se kuch irshad kiya. I'm so much in tune with nature, so much affinity with nature that when the bud make that sound, I bent my ear and said, are you talking to me? Something like that. Now, do these things talk to you? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. And uh, it's, I think it's what's magic in life, mm -hmm. truly. You know, that chatak. <laughs> you know, to hear what cannot be heard is a great privilege and, and to see what cannot be seen to many right. is also something mm -hmm. special and, uh, and I'm very grateful to life for mm -hmm. having an eye <laughs> and, uh, and I thank everybody here for being here to give me support today as I'm not a stage girl. <laughs> and, I have to thank Bish and thank God I did not read his text before we came on stage. <laughs> and, um, and thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Goswami, you know, for being you know, with us on stage. You know, for me, it's a privilege and an honor because I've been a great admirer of your work. You might not know it. Um, but I've looked at a few things and I saw them again in this particular book, for which I have to thank um, Mapin, Vipinvai, and of course, our friend who spoke at length about the way in which the whole thing came about. Floral patterns are the ones which, are, which dominate your, your work. You have a special fondness for one particular flower or one particular Buddha, one particular plant? Or? Yes, I do. 
And quite evidently. And um, from the beginning, and I think from my youth, um, I have a dear childhood friend who is Iris, his aunt, who said, but I remember you as a teenager drawing puppies uh -huh. and uh, making a, a scarf for me with a puppy. So, yes, the puppy, really? the Indian puppy that has inspired so many painters, so many artists. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not any flower, it's a flower with immense beauty, whether it's a garden poppy or an opium poppy or this poppy or that poppy. And we are in a country of the growing poppy. It has been used by Rajput people, by the Bishnoi people. It has been used as a medicine. It has been used to put children to sleep, it has the been used. used mostly for the product of the poppy rather and, than uh, But it's, what's <laughs> fabulous is that it's a, it's, a, it's a flower with great nobility mm -hmm. and, and as all like special flowers it, it is uh, beautiful and dangerous too. <laughs> Dangerous too, and I think I love the puppy also because it is it has that that measure too, and and um, uh, Mughal artist depicted the puppy in mm -hmm. the most beautiful way, and and when my father-in-law gave me a fragment of a large mm -hmm. uh, textile with the poppy that I've been printing now for nearly 30 years, I, I was spellbound. And, and, um, and I like to print it very large, very small, mm -hmm. and um, I have many, so many poppies in my collection over the years that I've had to give them, mm -hmm. I, I don't like to give numbers to, of, ver, of reference to my prints, so I always baptize them. And, and so I've had to find names in so many languages to <laughs> describe uh, that particular uh, puppy or, mm -hmm. or this one. Right. And um, so, yes, it must be my favorite, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and among the, the trees or the plants, the cypress, you stand uh, like a cypress, I mean, you know. Yes, um, so the... Cypress strikes me with its sober elegance uh. and uh, pointed, sharp, sober. And, uh, yeah, that's why I love it too. <laughs> you, you have cypresses in your own garden? And I've never managed to, to grow a decent one. <laughs> I've tried many times. And uh, they never, you know, they get... I wondered why, because they should be growing around, yeah. being depicted in so many paintings as mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. and as an important tree in, uh, in the North Indian uh, history. You, you have so many of them in the yeah. paintings, you have so many of them in growing in Kashmir. I've never managed to grow a straight, beautiful <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one. So that's why I planted many on my textile. Uh, you know, the poet half is um, is remembered by this particular couplet, the shere half is a shiraz me rakhsando me goyand, siya chashmane kashmiri paturkane samarkhandi, talking about those who live in the samarkhand and cypress like this stand and so on, if they sing my songs, then my life is worth living or something like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I relate to that. Thank you. Uh, the fact that block printing, for instance, in India traditionally belonged to people who belong who, who came from a low caste or class, cheaper, right? Yes. Right? Yes. And have you worked, you obviously have worked with traditional cheapers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have um, regrets for not being able to convince my dear master printer to come today. He was too intimidated and said, you know, you'd be only amongst educated people and I'm not. And, and, 
and I wanted to convince him, but then I left him and I said that <laughs> tomorrow I would bring very special people to watch him working and give him praise oh, yeah. for what he does with me. And um, yes, like a lot of craftsmen, uh, people doing things often come very humble um, in front of people who speak about mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. or who order these things and uh, and uh, there I think the voice of the craftsman is has to see with the chatak you were yeah. speaking about mm -hmm. uh, for the few people who can see uh -huh. mm -hmm. the real beauty of, yeah. of yeah. special special craft and India as this immense, immense treasure grove of craft at the highest, uh, of the highest quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think for creative people, for people with an eye, or people who want to do something, it's, it has no match anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it happens because India is such a large country, mm -hmm. and what fascinated me from the beginning, from my being here, was that I had access some, to a knowledge which had never, which had crossed time, centuries, never interrupted. And I don't think it is only in craft. Oh. I think it's in many other fields. But in, in my field, in the field of textile particularly, I, th I think it's, a, it's an amazing reality. And, and sometimes we are worried about knowledge disappearing and we live now in a world where things go so fast mm -hmm. and with instruments like telephones and computers you're supposed to answer immediately, you're supposed to, to go faster and faster and faster and um, I b believe that craftsmen, young craftsmen, you know, when you have a craft with young craftsmen, you think that's yeah. we're pretty safe mm -hmm. and it's happening. So if young people come to work in this field, that means that it's worth doing it. But if they get a chance to do some re something else out of tradition because they will make a better living yeah. out of it, mm -hmm. then they will leave it. Right. And I think we all have to be very careful and more conscious and more aware of the treasure we have here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to let it go. And uh, I'm sure many people here understand what, what, I'm, what I mean. You know, um, talking about cheapers, uh, Chandramani Singh, who wrote a very, very, very fine essay in this particular book, Thank you. And, um, Thank you, Chandramani. <laughs> and also, of course, I mean, Jasleen Thamija talks about all this and so on. The, traditionally, traditionally, are there cheapas from other parts of India that you have worked with? Um, all these like years, the all these years, no. You know, all the Northern Belt had cheapas and uh, um, chippas were decorating the dresses. Um, I've chosen today to wear uh, a village print as a skirt because it's one of the most beautiful print I've seen. And, and people, tribal people, village people used to wear a particular print which gave them you know, their identity mm -hmm. as a particular uh, social group. And, and, and so you had printers everywhere, you know, from um, Sindh and, and Gujarat, Gaj Rajasthan, 
in the north, in UP, in quite at large in the Gangetic mm -hmm. uh, plain as well, then of course in the south as well. And um, I'm not an historian, so mm. <laughs> I won't be able to go in, in detail. But in Rajasthan, um, you have Jaipur is the most important and last large center for block printing. There are many um, um, ateliers and and uh, um, and I have to pay uh, homage to someone who could have been here but could not come, Faith Singh, mm -hmm. who um, um, created uh, the the. Anoki, she she certainly put back block printing done in this region on the world map, and and she she's just ten, ten years older to me, and 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 she uh, she's done something wonderful. Mm -hmm. So she's done something. So I've worked with. She inspired me, and and uh, to do it. Uh, when when I decided to um, stay in India, um, it's the printed garden that took over, and and seeing what she was able to do, I thought I also could work with printers and do something different, but yeah, do yeah. something. Yeah. And all were, my my tool was ready, <laughs> and. Um, a lot of, in the 80s, um, in the hippie wave, a lot of cheap prints yeah. were exported, and so much so that all the local printers became very rich and abandoned their printing, um, and called people from a region and we have a lot in uh, in um, in Jaipur. We have a lot of printers coming from Farukabad, mm -hmm. uh -huh. where they do not find much work. So a lot of the carvers, the block makers, and the printers come from Farukabad uh -huh. to to Jaipur to to work. And then naturally there are people from elsewhere, from Gujarat as well. From uh, so uh, we have two communities. We have the Muslim community, we have the Hindu community, and what always fascinated me was that Muslim and Hindu alike worked together without any problem. You know, if my master printer at the moment is Muslim, some of his workers are not Muslim, they are Hindus. And um, same for the block making, some are Hindus and yeah. some are Muslim, and, and they work together, and we all work together. Thank you. A question. Printress of the Mughal garden. That's a word I have not heard before. Is it an <laughs> invention? Is it inspired by you, stand like a princess or something like that? <laughs> and, uh, um, Printress. The, it's a charming word. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, that was left to me by a friend who is a garden photographer, uh -huh. and she came and she came and she walked in my gar garden at this time of the year where the garden is at its best, all full of bloom and vegetables and and she she loves she loves insects and bees and she takes a lot of photographs of so my garden is really buzzing at the moment <laughs> and when she left she left a very very pretty note and she said your garden I leave your garden with regret it yeah. is funny because it is block planted <laughs> by you know the printress <laughs> and and I thought it was a beautiful word and yes. and uh, and beach. Did you? And Let me add in here, <laughs> while we were producing the book, my colleague Sheila Reddy, uh -huh. uh, she heard and we were talking and then she heard this word and she said, wow, this is the word really? we are looking really for really for is. the book, Printress of the Mughal Garden. Yeah. So ultimately when it came on the book cover, it was I mean, because of Sheila who suggested. Thank uh, you, Sheila. <laughs> no. 
made, it makes a wonderful impression. I mean, it's a lovely word, there's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Do we have a couple of more minutes or what? Five minutes. <laughs> um, in respect of colors, you have a favorite, which, you know, above everything else, I mean, you, you love all colors, I'm quite sure of that. Yes, I do. And? And I love red. Red. And I love, but I love green even more than red. And, and I love Yellow red because green. of green, ah. because green, because of red. <laughs> Two guesses I was, I mean, I didn't share them with you. I thought you would say poppy is your favorite flower and red is your favorite color. I mean, that's what I thought. But here I would just briefly mention, long time ago I saw a book published from Benares, from which a place where Chandramani Ji comes from, on by Devaki Ahivasi, I think it was, wasn't it? On Rangai Ke Chape Vastra and so on. There was a poem there in Hindi, 19th century poem, in which Radha and Krishna are playing holy. Radha throws one color powder at Krishna and Krishna responds and throws a different color. Forty-seven colors are woven into that poem. Amazing composition. You know, and these are not colors, I mean, they, they're not European names or whatever like that. They are purely Indian of the soil. Golanari, Golabasi, you know, Shaftalu, this and that and so on. Astonishing thing. And I might commend it to your favor. I mean, to ask somebody to, to, to read them for you. And you might really enjoy that. I will. I will. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Professor. One final thing. Um, I did a work some time ago on patkas, Mughal patkas, basically. Now, patkas have all these floral ends, and so especially the panel, the end panel, etc., is a, has a Shah Jahani kind of a motif on it. And extraordinary objects, extraordinary, I'm sure you know them well. I happen to ask one botanist, can you identify this particular motif for me, this flower or this plant? And he said, it is not true. In the sense, the flowers come from one plant, the leaves are from a different plant and so on, things like this. It's, a, it's an amalgam, right, of this and that. Is that something which is present to your mind? Does it bother you or does, are you excited by it or what? I, uh, most designers are not also botanists. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and when you... I put myself in the head of, you know, old designers for textiles and how they choose this flower with this leaf and that curl and that. Uh, um, yes, they they were not always bothered by botany, and and so it had to be pretty, beautiful, acceptable, and but many old designs, I think. It's my feeling for textiles or jewelry or weaponry or architecture. I think we're produced by painters. Mm -hmm. We're painting miniatures. And, and uh, we didn't have designers then. Mm -hmm. And we, we had painters and artists to, to prepare when, when people had to do uh, very fine work. And, and um, I think some artists did bother about something that resembled to nature and others did not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what matters at the end, it <laughs> should look <laughs> beautiful. Design, and, right, right, uh, right. But Mughal artists produce a lot of things that you can completely identify, uh -huh. whether the hibiscus or uh, um, uh, lily or uh, poppy or um, tulip or mm -hmm. you can, many, many uh, designs, uh, you know, 
a lot of people have called, you know, it's sometimes scholars do mistakes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not gardeners too. <laughs> and they call a poppy an hibiscus, for mm -hmm. example. <laughs> you know, the Mughal uh, plants that we see in great painting, I mean, and also the Shah Jahani architecture, the Pietra Dura, um, they are inspired by European herbals. Yes. But European herbals were very often authentic, in the sense they're true to the nature of the plant or the flower. Hmm. Whereas when they were imported into India, the idea was, right, then the Indian craftsmen adapted themselves and went away from the herbals. Yes, the literal absolutely, herbals, absolutely. And then they started doing something different. I mean, this is true of so many things which arrive in India from outside. You pick and choose and you combine and so on and so forth like that. I think, I think it's how knowledge and, and, and art moves from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. It's picked up and initially it's quite close to what you've picked up and then somebody else picks it up and it, it's slightly transformed and, and it keeps traveling mm -hmm. in time or yeah, yeah. geographically as well. And, um, and at the end you get something completely different and I think that's one of the things that fascinated me between East and West, how uh, in the story and the history of block printing, design designs went from Europe to India, back to Europe, mm -hmm. back to India, yeah. and on the way it went a bit further and and uh, towards the south and came back and uh, and uh, I'm happy I added to the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> Have you come across a word called cheapy or no? And no. No. <laughs> Shippy means naughty in French. <laughs> would be a naughty girl. <laughs> would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, let me conclude with a, with a very fine painting which comes to my mind. It's a Pahari painting of the early 19th century. There was a saint, a kind of a devotee of Vishnu, by the name of Chipa Bhagat. And as the painting shows him sitting down and printing a piece of, on a piece of cloth the word Ram, 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 Ram. But the interesting thing about that particular painting is that in one corner of the house, the poor house in which the Chipa is working, is Vishnu cooking a meal for Chipa. It is, he is so absorbed in his work that the God, great god Vishnu descends along with Lakshmi, go into his kitchen and produce food for him because he has no time for doing anything else. Maybe somebody will descend and while you are working, right? who knows. But it's a privilege, may I say again, and a delight to be able to sit down with you and talk to you, and also this, this particular group as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, Professor Goswami. Uh, thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, if you'd like to stay seated, I'm now going to invite Anand Shah uh, from Ignite Solutions to present a special attraction in the book, which is an augmented reality. Thank you. What a delight, delightful talk. Uh, so we have been working with Mapin in experimenting with how we can bring printed pages to life through a digital medium. I'm told I have very little time, so I'll just jump to the actual demonstration, but what we did with Brigitte's work is we took various images in the printed book and we have a free app that we've developed. Um, if you can switch over, so there you can see my phone on the screen and I'm going to launch this app and I'm going to just go and scan an image in the book and what you see now is a video. Unfortunately, due to technical issues, we can't hear the audio track. But this is Bridget's uh, work. And we can even hear her interviews and uh, see her working with that. Uh, there are multiple images associated with this. I'll go and scan one more. So 
it can be images of different sizes. And what we are trying to do is really experiment and see how we can bring all this wealth of knowledge and information that authors and people like Brigitte have and put it in a way that extends the confines of a, of a printed book. So this is uh, some augmented reality demonstration. It's available with uh, every copy of the book. It's a free app that you download with instructions inside. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be associated with this project. Thank you. A vote of thanks. My first words of gratitude are to the printress herself for giving me unhindered access to the treasure trove of her creations, not the least among which was the Amla Jan candy jar I regularly stole from her kitchen between shoots. A word of thanks to all the women and men at the Haveli who allowed me to shoot while they worked without the slightest of complaints. My thanks to all distinguished authors of this book. Chandramani ji is present here and Sheila Reddy. Sunil Menon has been a partner in crime in many projects we have moonlighted together. For this book, Sunil served like the Sanjaya of Mahabharat. His lyrical commentary, taking cues from Preeta Sen's exhaustive interviews of Bridget, complemented the beautiful motives. Sheila Reddy, another friend and colleague, squeezed out time from writing her own critically acclaimed magnum opus, Mr. and Mrs. Jinnah, to paint a lucid portrait of Bridget. My special thanks to Dayanita Singh, Raghu Karnad, Bijani Satpati and Shurupa Sen, Ilyas Rafael Khan, Lila Victor, and Vidya Eva. Vidur Conrad, my son, and Iris have contributed invaluably through this project, styling many photographs and giving design feedbacks. And another thanks to Bridget to present this shirt to me, which I'm wearing this today from her collection. Thank you, everybody, for coming for this launch. Uh, thank you again to our speakers. Uh, they'll be available to sign copies of the new book uh, at the book signing tent at the back, so please uh, have a chat with them there and go and see them if you'd like to. Um, and if you hold tight, in about five minutes' time, uh, we'll be finding out what the Oxford Dictionary's Hindi word of the year is. So hold tight. <laughs>